Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of Weapons and Warfare from Straight Arrow News. I'm your host, Ryan Robertson, and we are here in National Harbor, Maryland at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space Exposition. Over the next few weeks, we are going to bring you some of the most amazing stories that come out of this event. From new tech to the next generation of sailors, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen, we've got it covered. And with that, let's go ahead and get into our headlines. After a fatal crash of an Air Force V-22 in November of last year, all Ospreys were temporarily grounded while the initial crash investigation got underway. In early March of this year, more than 400 Ospreys and their flight crews were allowed to resume flight training and operations. They've been given some guidance on maintenance and operational procedures that the services have been following. Um, each service is returning at their own pace based on operational need. And so you've seen probably in the media recently, uh, the Navy's back up flying, got an aircraft out at Norfolk. Marine Corps has been back active and supporting the Muse and getting ready for uh, upcoming deployments. So, so far it's been going well. They're getting the, their legs back underneath them and, and getting back up in the air. Officials involved in the crash investigation identified a part failure as the cause of the crash, but they have yet to say what that part failure is. Although investigators did indicate the issue is unrelated to any previous crash. One interesting piece of hardware on display at this year's expo was the long range anti-ship missile built by Lockheed Martin. The stealth looking weapon is part of the next wave of platforms that will use semi-autonomous guidance to provide a precision strike on a target that's usually in motion. What that means is it can course correct without operator input. The folks involved in the project at Lockheed Martin say it's an exciting development. This new target set and, and the capability you need to go against that target set, this weapon is at the premiere of, of, going against, of going against that target. So this weapon as a former warfighter gets me really excited to, to find that capability and know that we're gonna build that capability and, and give it to the fleet. The LRASM, as it's also known, is fresh off a recent test firing that included four missiles at the same time. The Navy is being pretty mum on specifics, but they did say the test met all expectations. Among the other stories to emerge from Sea Air Space 2024 is California-based drone maker SailDrone announcing a partnership with Thales Australia. The pair will integrate Thales's Blue Century Thin Line Towed Array with Sail Drone's Surveyor Class Uncrewed Surface Vessels. The matchup makes for a handy tool to conduct autonomous anti-submarine warfare missions. Towed arrays use sonar to locate potential threats in the area, basically acting like underwater surveillance. Pair that with the size and range of the Surveyor Class Sail Drones, and it gives operators the ability to gather intel from literally thousands of miles away. Up next for the collaborators, a series of tests for the Navy to focus on the ability of the surveyor to deliver intel from above and below the water surface. For the most part, the problems faced by one branch of our national defense are usually pretty similar to the problems faced by the other branches of our national defense. In that regard, the Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard really aren't that different from the Army, Air, and Space Forces. Of course, how they analyze and approach problem solving is as unique as their individual histories. For our maritime elements, that means aligning new thinking with their core beliefs. This year's gathering started with a leadership panel featuring some of the most senior voices in our nation's maritime defenses. Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Lisa Franchetti, with nearly four decades of service to her credit and the first woman to serve on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, hammered home her stance that the Navy not only needs more sailors, but needs them trained and ready to serve, telling the audience, it's pretty clear that we need a bigger Navy, and every study since 2016 has said we need a larger Navy. The more important thing right now is having a ready Navy. When you talk about more players on the field, that really is ready players on the field. That sentiment was echoed by Undersecretary of the Navy, Eric Raven, who told those gathered in National Harbor, Maryland, we need budgets to support our strategy with people and readiness coming first. Assistant Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, General Christopher Mahoney, 
pointed to his branch's retention numbers, which are, quote, very, very good. At the same time, he acknowledged the Corps can't stand pat and not address quality of life issues. That equates to the conditions of the barracks, access to health care, access to child care, good child care, good gyms, and you've got to bring in new ideas to continue. Not sit there and declare victory once again, but to make sure that you are addressing needs that they have. Admiral Franchetti also addressed the military's need for Congress to do its job, specifically getting the budget for the next fiscal year done in a timely manner. Getting a budget on time, not having a continuing resolution, would be very helpful for us to maintain the momentum that we are trying to achieve. Serving you clarity through context, our mission at SAN is to deliver the news straight down the middle. We're different from mainstream media because we spotlight distorted headlines and show you how to do it too. Discover stories that right and left-leaning outlets are choosing not to cover by using our Media Miss tool. Download the SAN app and turn on notifications to have straight facts delivered right to your phone or tablet and get straight facts anytime at san.com. All right, folks, it's time once again for our weapon of the week this week, and we have a doozy. I am standing in front of the Prowler. It's made by Metal Shark, and joining me to talk about this thing is the president CEO of Metal Shark, Christopher Allard. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. The Prowler, tell me about this thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool product. So we, um, last five or six years, we've been working on autonomous vessels, different Coast Guard, Navy, Marine Corps. Uh, learned a lot and wanted to take an opportunity to develop something that really wasn't targeted at a specific set of requirements that was, you know, we could tailor it to what, what we thought some of the options could be done. A um, couple things about her, she's about 30 feet long, uh, inboard diesel powered, but also um, autonomous. She has a self-powered front wheel that allows her to kind of climb a ramp, move around a base, three to five miles an hour not long range, just getting in and out of the water on its own. And then the front wheel retracts and the rear wheels um, are over the road highway rated. It is its own trailer. Um, we learned a lot in the USV space about how hard it is sometimes in a USV mission when it starts at location A, moves to location B, and it didn't bring its own trailer, it didn't bring its own support system. So working to try and get it to be self-sufficient um, in those kind of applications. It's also semi-submersible. Okay. Um, it wasn't in the original design brief, but one of my engineers and I were looking at it and we really realized that it wasn't that hard. And, and effectively, the boat's a, a boat in a boat, if you will. There's a, a box in the middle. Um, the box is watertight, carries the engine, the fuel, the autonomy systems, all the things that it takes to operate. And then the outer part of the boat is basically tanks, free to flood. Okay. Um, she operates at speed like a, a normal boat, but once she stops, she kind of automatically ingests water into these tanks, uh, creates a lower profile, which um, you know certain applications is nice from a uh, visibility or lack of perspective, but also it makes her more sea kindly on station, right? So the extra water is uh, added mass dampening, so it keeps the boat more stable for both the sensors and then also for survivability in kind of higher sea states that it might have to live through. So um, yeah, those are our primary features. So. You bet, and we have a, you know, kind of a demonstrator yeah. micro USV up here. And that's really, you were saying, just kind of demonstrate the capabilities that the Prowler could do, right? Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the maturity level of Prowler and, and what we put into that is further along than the micro USV. Um, but, you know, we've seen with our clients, you know, the, the word attritable is talked about a lot. And, and I think as the market goes forward, attritable will continue to get smaller and cheaper. Um, and we wanted to kind of demonstrate that that's available commercially. But then also, uh, you know, launch and recovery is such a big thing. And, you know, the ramp was a key part of what we wanted to do. Yeah. And we wanted to test to see, as opposed to these launch and recovery capture methods, which are really challenging, can we just drive it up on the boat? And um, so it's kind of a you know, a demonstrator for that. She, she's certainly, you know, that one, if you take her apart, there's everything that needs to be in it isn't, but, but we're, we're, we're just showing what, what our thought process is, so. You bet, you bet. So you said you're, you're working with Marines in the Navy right now. It's, there's no contracts yet, but you're working to hopefully get to that point. Is that correct? We still have an ongoing contract with the Marines in support okay. of the LRUSV. We're certainly at the tail end of it. You know, the boats have been fielded, the Marines have been operating them. Um, but yeah, that, that one's still ongoing. Okay, you bet. 
What's next for Prowler? What's the future? You know, I mean, part of coming here and, and doing what we're doing with it to this and a couple of shows is, is to get feedback, mm. see what ideas hit home, what don't, um, sure. understand what people are trying to do. Um, you know, we are moving into kind of developing our own uh, command and control system that'll give us the ability to control them. Okay. Um, that's not done yet, but um, that would be what was what would be next. You know, the ability to we want to make it a turnkey solution um, that will then just interface with a software only with autonomy providers, uh, UAV providers, automatic target recognition providers. Um, that's not our space, but we can provide the host system that makes them ready to. Ready to, go. ready to do that with a, a software update, you know, you that bet. kind of thing. So you that's bet. our goal. So this is the Prowler from Metal Shark, one of the more eye-catching USVs out there on the market today. And with the need that the Navy and Marine Corps have for more surface vessels, I can imagine you'll be seeing more of these on the water very soon. All right, folks, time now for comms check. And this week we have an update for you from Brandon Singh, the president and co-founder of Shield AI. Now known best for its Hivemind AI pilot and the VBAT vertical takeoff and landing drone, a lot has happened for Shield AI since the last time we spoke with Brandon at the AFA Warfare Symposium back in Colorado. The company recently landed a $500 million investment in a Series F round of funding. That's a good indication of their vision and the defense industry's goals aligning. Talk to me about uh, Shield AI merging with Sentient. I mean, just how did that process come about and what is it going to mean for, for Shield AI? Just recently, we made an acquisition of a company, an Australian company called Sentient Vision Systems that was working with a technology called Wide Area Motion Imagery. And we've been working with Sentient on a joint product since about July of last year that we are calling Sentient Observer which takes, this, uh, takes their VIDAR product and really takes it to the next generation capability, next leap, which we're gonna first introduce on the VBAT, but it will be widely available to any OEM, to all aircraft providers, just as our AI pilot HiveMind is available to any OEM or aircraft providers as well. So Brandon, tell me about this, the Sentient Observer. So this is Sentient VIDAR, it's their legacy product. Sentient Observer is our next generation product that takes the same technology just to the next level. There's huge applications for search and rescue. That, that was really the primary capability that they were focused on really early on was search and rescue capabilities um, where you can find people on the water again with just a couple pixels of information coming from the camera. Something that would, you know, you or I, if we were watching the video feed, we wouldn't be able to see. This thing sees it. Um, there are other applications, maritime safety of navigation applications as we think about you know, ships and, and other vessels. Um, but primarily today, this is on aircraft. It does search and rescue. It finds things with very high, what we would call search integrity, very fast. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. All right, folks, for this week's wrap, I'm going to take a cue from Admiral Linda Fagan, the Commandant for the United States Coast Guard. For the last two years, during the opening ceremonies of the Navy League's Sea Airspace Expo, the Commandant said the most important aspect, weapon, tool, or resource of any service branch is the people. As Admiral Fagan puts it, without people, ships aren't built, aircraft don't fly, and weapons don't fire. It's easy to get caught up in the fancy displays at these defense expos or the attention-grabbing headlines about military budgets. But at the core of all of it is people. At this expo, I met plenty of people from around the country who are all trying, in their own ways, to make this country better and safer by helping and protecting the people who protect our nation. Whether it's the Honeywell engineer designing new weather radars so helicopter pilots can avoid lightning strikes, or a boat builder from Florida whose designs offer a smoother ride on the water, thus protecting the knees and lower backs of the people operating the boat. Every design, every characteristic of the technology being developed and put on display at these expos is purpose driven to enhance the war fighting capability of the people at the center of the conflict putting the warfighter above the warfighting. In many ways, the service branches are learning what some in the civilian world are starting to realize as well. The better your employees have it at work, 
the more likely they are to like what they do and want to stay. It seems like a fairly simple concept, but not one often carried out effectively. If our nation's sea service branches and the others that make up our military can continue to embrace the concept of warfighter over warfighting, perhaps many of the issues plaguing our armed services and our armed service members would be that much easier to deal with. And maybe, just maybe, some of those problems might cease to exist altogether. But that's gonna do it for us from here at National Harbor. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.